we're going to go into this thing in a bimetallic gauge. Now everybody know what a bimetallic gauge is? A bimetallic gauge. This is, a, this is your electrical test nine. Bimetallic gauge talking about. And this is the old kind of gauges that we used to have back in the uh, uh, late 60s. Uh, and they stayed around on some cars until the late 70s. General Motors started in the real early 70s having magnetic gauges, which is a different kind of gauge. But in a bimetallic gauge, needle movement indicates varying amount of current going to the circuit. That's a true or false question. That is true. And the way that works is, uh, you guys gonna know what a, you know guys know guys know what a bimetal strip is. I can show you one. This one here. See that piece of metal right there. If you take that piece of metal right there and you heat it up, it's going to change shape. It's going to turn into a like this, and when it cools back down, it flattens back out. It'll do that every single time. And it's made out of two different kinds of metal. It's on the front of that. It's going to be made out of two different kinds of metal. And whenever the air coming through the radiator actually warms this up, it changes shape, does some valving in here to give this fan clutch more resistance. You see, that's a long and short of that, huh? Well, no, it's for the fan. It goes on the front of the yeah, water pump, but it, or there's a pulley, there's a water pump. There's a water pump, there's a pulley, there's this, and the fan is bolted to this. And so basically, to keep the engine from having to spin that aggravating, power-consuming fan all the time, this thing freewheels. Until it needs to pull more air, and this little valve right here changes some stuff on the inside of it. It's almost like a shock absorber. It, you know, the shock absorber gives you your damping stuff. This is a similar thing. It's got some jello stuff in there. But anyway, that's what a bimetal strip is. Now, inside a gauge, you're going to have a bimetal strip, and it's going to be fixed in such a way to where it's connected to your needle. All right. Coming into that gauge, you're going to have some wire, and it's going to be wrapped around that. All right. Now, that wire that's wrapped around that, uh, the, the more temperature, they got your uh, temperature sending unit over here, and it's actually going to be providing the ground for that as the resistance on the temperature gauge changes, you know, you got B plus coming in here. The more of a ground coming into the, through this gauge, and the, the more that is going to change shape, that little bimetal strip's going to bend, and as it moves, it moves that needle. Now what happens on a lot of the cars, the old cars in the late 60s and all, some of the Chrysler's the early 70s, when you go to start it, it would actually, you, uh, you'd, you'd see the needles go up and then they come back down, back to where they're supposed to be. But when you switched off the car, they went back all the way to the bottom because the bimetal gauge would cool off. Now, I don't, the, the only reason I'm telling you this is because that's the way gauges used to work. And so there, there's this particular uh, bunch of questions from the University of Missouri curriculum. They talk a lot about bimetal gauges and all that kind of stuff, so I just want to tell you about that. If you short this to ground, and you're testing that bimetal gauge. Most of these bimetal gauges have got what you call an instrument voltage regulator to keep from getting burned up in case you uh, wind up with a with an issue where you've got to short the ground or something. All right. But anyway, um, in a bimetallic gauge, the bi bimetal strip moves the needle by way of a magnetic field. Uh, that is absolutely false. It does not move by a magnetic field. The third one. An instrument voltage regulator delivers regulated voltage to the gauge circuit. Now, on the ones that have bimetal gauges, the older cars, and I'm telling you, these are the old cars, uh, like in the pre-1970 and so on. Uh, very few of them in the uh, you know uh, 1970s had them still. Uh, but like I said, GM was pretty much the benchmark for this. Ford vehicles had bimetallic bimetallic gauges though on their pickup trucks and stuff and on a lot of their cars until, I mean, about 1987, they went with uh, magnetic gauges. And I'll tell you about magnetic gauges in a minute, too. This um, instrument voltage regulator is a little device uh, on the Ford cars. It looked, it had little connectors that almost looked like a 9-volt battery on them. And they would plug, it would plug on the back of the cluster and it would put that, send a gentle pulse to, the, to those gauge wires all the time. And if you went to your, if you turn on the key, and you unplugged your sending unit where it was screwed into the engine block or wherever it was, and you hooked your test light between ground and that, you would, if you saw a blinking light, then you would basically know you had a good circuit all the way through that your gauge would actually start moving because the test light would provide a ground for it. But that's how you would check to see if that circuit was good. Now, if you turned on the, if you disconnected the gauge, turned on the key, and you didn't see a light there with your little test light, then you would know that there was either a 
bad connection between here and the gauge, the gauge is burned out or something like that. Uh, and so that, that third question is true. That is a true question, a true answer on that one there. On a fourth, the fourth one, by the way, fourth question, the magnetic gauge uses balancing coils and magnetic fields to move the indicator. And it pretty much does. That's about the way that goes. Um, what they've got, and we've actually got some gauges up here that I, I've got on the bench that we actually would do that. Every time I go up front, I say I'm going to get me another uh, chalkboard, I mean a racer. I wish somebody would tell me what over that little thing because it just vanished. And I don't even know why anybody would want it. All right. Now then, on your, um, this particular thing here, imagine yourself with a couple of copper windings. And the gauge needle is actually going to line up with the one of those that's got the most magnetism, right? And so if you can set it up so that you're powering and grounding this coil, when you power and ground the coil and there's no ground coming through the sensor, then the gauge is going to read a certain way. And then when there's a full ground coming through the sensor, as it goes up, you're going to read the other way. Um, when you disconnect, you now you guys that are taking electrical, pay attention to what I'm about to tell you. When you disconnect the engine coolant temperature sensor, on a, uh, when we disconnect the engine coolant temperature sensor and we short that terminal to ground, what is the gauge going to do? You guys know? What's your gauge going to do if you disconnect the engine coolant temperature sensor at the engine block and you take a jumper wire and you short that wire to ground, what you're going to see the gauge do? It's going to go all the way to hot. When you unhook the ground, it goes all the way. Look. Now, fuel temp I mean, the fuel pressure, I mean, excuse me, fuel level gauge, the temp <coughs> the fuel gauge, it works the opposite. If you disconnect the wires from the fuel gauge, it's going to go past full. If you connect them, to, if you ground the wire that feeds the fuel gauge, it's going to go all the way to empty. So one way you can check your fuel gauge to see if it's even able to do a full needle sweep is to just go to your gas tank and unplug the wires and then switch the key on and see what the gauge does. If it goes all the way past full, you're fine. You find out which wire it is on the, the uh, like the Mercury Sable we got out here. It's a yellow wire with a white strap. You hook that wire to ground, you're going to see that gauge go all the way back. But you need to switch the key off and back on between your connections because there's different strategies. This right here is a, a slosh module. And it's actually all of the uh, input from the sending unit to the gauge comes through this little board. And what it does is, uh, on some of the GM cars that we used to ride around in, when you got on it really hard, your gas gauge would slap over to empty because the gas sloshed to the back of the tank. And then when you come back, it would come back up. You know, this kind of thing. It would move around. And they really don't want the, needle, the gauge doing this, you know. So just about everybody out there now, uh, most of the uh, instrument clusters on our cars now are actually like a computer. You know, they're not even, you know, they don't even have regular gauges in them anymore. But a lot of the vehicles that are running around still do, and that's one of the reasons we're talking about this. But anyway, remember, you got two coils, and you got three connections on one of these gauges, and you can actually see how that works out there. One of you, how many of you guys have done the worksheet on the gauges? You done the worksheet on the gauges over here? I mean, where you actually take the instrument cluster, and you connect the wires to it, and you see where the gauge goes and all that. You can actually test it right there on a bench. Um, okay, in a magnetic gauge... The armature, and I remember number four was true. In a magnetic gauge, the armature rotates in response to magnetic action. That's question number five, and that one's true. The rest of you guys keep working on your test, your other test. Okay. Uh, I know I'm talking and it's a little distracting, but you can suck it up. All right. Sending units are used to primarily in systems designed to warn of dangerously high temperatures. Hmm. All right. Think of another sending unit. What other kind of sending unit do we have? There's various different sending units that we have out there in the gas gauge is one of them I was talking about. Um, how many of you guys have ever seen a, uh, a, a pickup truck or something with a transmission, <coughs> transmission temperature gauge on it? You ever, seen a, you ever looked at the dashboard of a truck and saw a transmission temperature gauge on it? Uh, you're going to see that in more and more of them. You know, the transmission temperature is pretty important. If you're, how many of you have ever been in a traffic jam where you had to sit in traffic for a long time on a hot day? All right. If you got your vehicle in drive, the transmission is going to get hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter, and it could eventually start boiling the fluid and puking fluid out the vent. So the smart thing for you to do if you're sitting a long time in a traffic jam, and I'm talking about an hour or so, 
it's kick that sucker up neutral. We're going to keep the transmission getting hot. Because when the torque converter is shearing that fluid, it's continually getting hotter and hotter. And when you're not moving, there's not a lot of air coming through that transmission uh, cooler. Okay. Let's see. Number seven. Everybody keep it up with me here? Okay. Number seven. The instrument voltage regulator maintains an average of 10 volts of current flow uh, to the gauge circuit. Well, what do you think about that? That's something you really don't have any way of knowing unless I tell you. No, it's typically about 5 volts if it's got an instrument voltage regulator. Now, listen up. A magnetic gauges don't have instrument voltage regulators. Some of them may have a little resistor or something on them. Um, and a lot of times you can take your test light and hook it to ground and touch the wire going to a magnetic gauge. And if that light lights up a little bit, you do know you've got a good circuit all the way back to your gauge. You know, occasionally you'll have bad gauges. Um, okay, let me see. Number 8. Uh, thermistor varies its resistance in relation to current surges. How many of you guys have ever heard of a thermistor? <coughs> you ever heard of a thermistor? Uh, the, a thermistor is basically a temperature sending unit, the heart of a temperature sending unit. If a temperature gauge depends on a thermistor to work, and I thought I had one in here. I do have one on that board over there, on that board with little sensors on it. And basically, uh, the ones that we typically use on cars, if something gets hotter, do you expect it to get more resistance or less? A piece of wire or anything, if you make it hotter, do you typically expect it to have more resistance or less resistance? Hey, girl. Are you, are you in the office for a while? No, I'll be back even though I've got a class at 12. You go, girl. But, um, but anyway... Uh, uh, whenever something gets hot, and uh, you guys must not have been exposed to any of that, uh, you typically are going to see uh, resistance on a piece of wire or something get higher. Now, listen to this term here and burn it in. You hear me? Positive temperature coefficient. That's what that is when something does what you expect. It, it gets more resistance as it gets hotter. That's positive temperature coefficient. Negative temperature coefficient is whenever you heat it up and the resistance goes down. And that's what our coolant temperature sensors and intake air temperature <coughs> sensors and transmission oil temperature sensors, that's what they all do. The more, the lower the resistance goes, I mean, the hotter it gets, the lower the resistance goes. And the lower resistance goes, the more current to ground you have and the higher that gauge reads, you see. That's how that particularly works. So uh, a thermistor is not going to vary its resistance in relation to current surges. It's basically going to vary its resistance in uh, relation to uh, temperature. The instrument voltage regulator is either mounted in or near the alternator. That's a bunch of hooey. That's false. We're not going to go there. I mean, it's, it's always mounted on the back. If it's got one, and it'll only have one if it's got bimetal gauges, it's going to be on the back of the instrument cluster, typically on the printed circuit. You guys know what a printed circuit is, right? You know what a printed circuit is? You know what a printed circuit is? It's one of those little... This is a printed circuit that you cannot see because it's got that plastic. If you remember seeing the little, well, the one that I really wanted to show you is out there outside in the shop. But it's on the back of the thing. It's got all those little copper strips running through here. You know what I'm saying? You've seen that thing? It's it's it looked like a little plastic. Huh? It's made of fiberglass? Well, not typically. Uh, it's typically made of tough plastic like this. This one's just this has just got a cover on the back of this. This is one of those gauges that's actually a computer. It doesn't actually have the kind of gauges we're talking about. And these gauges are driven by the microprocessor in this instrument cluster. But the other uh, kind of printed circuit I'm talking about is almost like this, but this is basically a circuit board. A printed circuit is flexible. You can bend it, and you can see copper strips in it that are carrying all of the current and everything. So, uh, But anyway, it's mounted over there. Point number 10, when replacing an instrument voltage regulator, or a gauge unit, the technician should always disconnect the negative battery cable first. What do you think about that? That's true, but why would we disconnect the negative battery cable first? Anybody got any ideas? Why do you replace, uh, disconnect the negative battery cable first? Mark, you got any ideas about that? Here's another rule of thumb I'm going to give you for electrical people. When you disconnect the negative, it doesn't make as much of a spark as it does when you disconnect the positive. Also, why would uh, it, why would disconnecting the positive cable not be as good as disconnecting the negative one if you were trying to prevent some sort of an inadvertent short? This is something all of you can use. 
What about it? There it is. They always talk about. All right. Look at this. Here's the battery. All right. Plus, minus. Okay. Here's where the battery is in the car. All right. This is kind of generic. Let's say I take this one off. That cable's been disconnected. This cable's still connected. All right. Now, every part of this car is connected to that cable, isn't it? So if you drop anything, it can land on this car and go over here and touch a positive battery cable. You've got a lot of chances to short it something out. However, if you do it the other way, let's just swap the plus and the minus around because it's easier. Even if you drop something and it falls over here, well, yeah. Even if you drop something, it falls over here, it won't. The only way you can short it out that way is between here and here. Because this is disconnected now. The battery is disconnected from the body, so you don't even have any propensity for a short between the body and there anymore as long as that's disconnected. A negative battery cable is always the best one to disconnect first, one way or another. A lot of people disconnect first one and the other, and that... In most cases, you don't notice a whole lot of a difference. Some of these new cars nowadays don't even like being jumped off. You know, they're, I mean, the really new cars, you know, they're, uh, you know, manufacturers don't like people connecting jumper cables to them. And you can't really jump off a hybrid vehicle either. You know, don't, don't go there. Even though, it's, even though it's got the big battery and a little battery, you're not supposed to hook jumper cables up to it. Uh, let's see, the instrument voltage regulator, let me see right here. Let's see, a uh, fuel gauge is either a bimetallic or a magnetic gauge, you know, and that's uh, what we've been talking about already. You know, that's 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 basically true. I'm going over that test, by the way. Um, number 12, seat belt warning devices are time delayed. How many of you guys have ever heard of seat belt warning device? You know, the one that goes bang, 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 whenever you're driving off without a seatbelt on, don't you? Yeah, my truck. If you've got a newer truck, you're going to have that. You know what's crazy about my Ford? If I drive off without buckling a seatbelt and go ding, 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 my Ford pickup that I got on my Taurus. But after I get going down the road, and I'm not saying I should do this, but I always wear my seatbelt. I don't drive without a seatbelt on, even a customer's car. You know, because you can have a not very uh, – serious accident and still get seriously damaged if you ain't got a seatbelt on. Furthermore, the seatbelt will usually keep your face out of the airbag. And I don't really want my face going into the airbag, you know what I'm saying? I just don't like that. You know, airbags are really kind of dangerous, you know. <laughs> but anyway, uh, what you can do, I can take off down the road on my pickup truck. After I buckle the seatbelt and I get moving, I can unbuckle it and it doesn't even pay any attention to that. <laughs> but if somebody unbuckles, if doesn't ever buckle it to start with, you know, it's okay, it raises cane. Um, there was a there was a Ford pick a little Ford Ranger that uh, my buddy Donnie was working on over at the uh, Ford place, and he actually had a uh, a speedometer problem where his speedometer would get up to about 25 miles an hour, and then it would drop to zero. Or the speedometer on the truck he was working on, and that thing had a seat belt uh, warning module that was mounted underneath the seat that was tied to vehicle speed and it was internally shorted to the point of where it would always kill the, it was, it, whenever the uh, seatbelt warning was supposed to come on, uh, its internal short would kill the speedometer signal and the speedometer would go to zero. And boy, I tell you, finding that was a sunny boy. You know. What you looking for? Huh? Huh? No, you're not using that book. You're listening to me. Sit down. Yeah, that's what we're talking about. Did he roll his eyes? All right. The stuff I'm telling you is not in that book. It's in something. I'm going to go over it with you, okay? Um, okay. Uh, a, pro a problem in a sending unit could cause a single gauge to malfunction. Could a problem in a sending unit cause a single gauge to malfunction, or could it not? Do you, do you people, are you people even uh, listening to me? Somebody give me an answer to that. Somebody give me an answer to that. Hello. If I've got a bad, if I've got a, a single gauge is malfunctioning, can that be a problem in a sending unit? So anybody, you guys are studying electrical stuff too. Well, I got two, four, six, eight, nine guys in here right now, and everybody's looking at me like a deer in the headlights. Somebody give me a yes or no answer. Can a sending unit cause a gauge to malfunction? Yes, it could. It could, can it? That's easy. That wasn't even a hard question. 
Why is everybody looking at me like a rubber dummy? When I went to General Motors School in 1981 in Houston, Texas, there was an instructor down there, it was a woman, and she was just as sharp as she could be. And there was 12 mechanics in that room, and they were all intimidated because none of them wanted to answer a question she asked, afraid they'd be wrong and they'd look silly. You know what I'm saying? So it's really, it's better. I mean, most of the teachers would rather you answer, even if the answer is wrong, you know, than to go that route. Uh, okay, now then, you know, we're hung up on these instrument voltage re regulator questions. An instrument voltage regulator is what? It is it A, a load control device, B, an insulating device, C, a type of printed circuit board, or D, all of the above? You know, we've kind of described that. Uh, the instrument voltage regulator, the ones that we're talking about, and remember, that's only on the ones with bimetal gauges, which is the really old car. How many, of you guys like, how many of you guys like really old cars? How many of you have really old cars? I got a 56 Huh? Yeah, you'll have bimetal gauges on that one. All right. All right. Now then, you got a, whatever you, that's instrument voltage right there. Basically, it's going to have a bimetal thing in it. Let me see. It's activating, it's acting kind of like a circuit breaker, basically. And it's grounded here, and it's got power going through it and coming out, and it's basically going to have a flashing signal that it sends out because that bimetal strip is going to move back and forth as it heats and cools, uh, like a circuit breaker. I mean, like a, uh, yeah, like a circuit breaker or a, or a turn signal flasher almost, except it's just a real slow, gentle pulse and everything. Hey, Adam. All right, now a potential, a potential, sure, no problem. Uh, a potentiometer varies resistance by using what? What is a potentiometer? Can anybody tell me what a potentiometer is? Has anybody ever seen a potentiometer? Look at this. See this potentiometer? And there's three wires going to it. And it's got a little thing in here, this little white part moves, you know. Okay. And uh, this is actually, and you've probably heard a lot of people talk about throttle position sensors. That's what that is. Yeah. A throttle position sensor, which is what that is, is a potentiometer. And this is how it works. This is good for the engine performance guys, too. All right, coming in, you got three terminals, right, on a potentiometer. Now watch this. He's either got, you got resistive paint, and I'm going to draw it like this. And resistive paint means the farther you slide on the paint, the more resistance it has from the you know, point of contact. You got five volts in. This right here is what we call signal return, but it's actually a ground. Think of ground, when you think of ground, think of return, because the power is going out and it has to come back, and the ground is the way it gets back. If there's resistance on the way back on the ground, it can cause the problem, the same problem resistance on the way in can cause. Okay, now see this, this wiper, that's going to slide on this stuff, as you move this closer to that 5 volts, the output here is going to change. Whenever this wiper is down here, that output is going to be about 1 volt. Whenever it slides up here, it's going to go up. Usually it won't go any higher than about 4.6. That's on a throttle position sensor. Now that's a potentiometer. So let's look at number 15 again. A potentiometer varies resistance by using A, a magnetic field, B, a bimetal strip wrapped in aluminum. C, an iron bar in a sliding aluminum housing. D, an iron bar in a sliding tungsten steel housing. E, a wrapped coil and a sliding contact. Now, what do you? Wait, what's the closest right answer to that that you see? That would be E, wouldn't it? If you would consider this a wrapped coil. Now, like I say, most of the potentiometers, like this little thing I got in my hand right here, it's not going to have wire in it. It's basically going to have some resistive paint. That's what it's going to have. Okay, now, um, when replacing the instrument voltage regulator, the technician must remove what? You know, what do you got to remove? That's number 16. You got to remove the instrument cluster to do that. Um, incidentally, on some of the vehicles, it's got bimetal gauges like on your older cars. And some of you guys seem to like older cars. You may be using them, you know, working on them. If you disconnect, if you pull the instrument uh, cluster out of the car and you're, and it's, has actually 
providing a ground through some of the mounting screws for the instrument voltage regulator, like on an 83 Jeep uh, Grand Wagoneer or whatever, you know, the J-Series Jeeps. Um, if you happen to have that thing not bolted into the dash and you turn on the key, it will burn up every gauge in that cluster. I've had it happen to me. I uh, didn't know that, hadn't seen that on any other vehicle before, but I had that cluster unbolted, and when I turned on the key, I saw every gauge go all the way over and until the little windings burned up, and they went all the way back, and they had to have all new gauges. Um, that was something that sort of blindsided me because I didn't say anything about it in the book, and I didn't realize that the ground was like it was. Some things you learn by doing. Uh, however, if you ignore what's in print and you do something and you break something, then you're going to be in hot water. Um, one time I was replacing the battery in a... Uh, little old car that had a, a hood that was like this. The hood was way down on the slope. All right. And the battery they had in there, the battery box was like this big, but the battery they had in there was real narrow. This was from the factory now, and the little J-bolt that mounted it, and there was another one on this side, was like that. Well, whenever I went into the uh, parts room and I got another battery, I said, I want to get a battery to fit this Eagle Summit or whatever it was. And we had we were the dealer for that. So they looked it up and they found the right battery for that car. And of course I had the I had the hood open. So they found the right battery for the car. And so I had this nice big battery box and I had this nice big battery you now. But I had to redo this little J bolt. Now when I put that J bolt in there because it had been made for that other one, it was sticking up really high. And this one here was sticking up about like that. And I said, you know, I wonder if that bolt is tall enough to when I close the hood, because this is farther forward now, and it's also tall enough, is it going to touch the hood when it comes back down? And, uh, if you don't consider things like that, imagine what would have happened if I had just slammed the hood. That bolt would have made a big dent in the hood and cracked the paint and may have even knocked a hole in it if I slammed it hard enough. Uh, but anyway, uh, that's something that always has to be considered. Another thing I've seen is batteries that were too high in a sloping car, they were too tall, and when you close the hood, the positive battery terminal was short against the hood. And the person that was driving the car wouldn't even know it, but he would know he was having all kinds of issues. You open the hood, and you can see a little somebody welding on the underside of the hood, and the battery terminal's all burned up because they put a battery in there that was too long and too tall. You know, a battery, all batteries are not created equal. You got, you got to put one in there that fits. That's the long and the short of that. Okay. Now then, let me see here. 17. The bulb in an automotive warning lamp is made of tinted glass. Right? Wrong. Is it made of tinted glass, tinted plastic? That's a screwed up question the way it's done there. Uh, mounted behind a colored lens, surrounded with a reflective metal. Look at this, guys. You see these warning lights on this thing? They're going to burn all different colors and everything. Do we have a bunch of different colored bulbs in there? No. We got a white bulb all on behind a piece of plastic. The only bulbs that are tinted they have any kind of tint to them at all. A lot of these uh, instrument cluster illumination bulbs will actually have a little plastic, you know, tube looking thing on them to make them have a, a lower tint so they're like a blue color so that they're not going to annoy you and shine in your eyes when you're driving down the road. And all that, so. But anyway, it's uh, uh, mounted behind a colored lens. That's the right answer for that. That's B, uh, I guess. I think that's right. The sending unit is usually a what? Is it usually a printed circuit board, a transistor, a type of fuse, a type of circuit breaker, or a grounding switch? What is it? It's number 18. 18. Well, we're, what, have, what have I been drawing up on the board, guys? It's going to be a switch or a resistor, or a thermistor, rather. It's actually going to increase or decrease the amount of continuity to ground, and it's going to cause whatever it is to happen. All right. In some vehicles, artificial or synthesized voices warn drivers of a condition that needs attention. Now, that's a kind of an archaic question, but in the early 80s, somebody, some people experimented with that. And the only problem with that was customers did everything they could as fast as they could to disable that because they absolutely hated it. I had a diagnostic machine that I was using called a Sun Interrogator uh, back in the late 70s, early 80s. And this thing was absolutely enormous. It was probably taller than this blackboard and as wide as from here to the edge of that. And it had a voice synthesizer on it that would talk to you and tell you what to do next. That um, doggone, um, what am I saying, that um, 
front end machine out there. It's got a voice synthesizer on it. Now then, okay, let's move on here. Uh, anyway, because of the fact that that lady thought her gas gauge was reading like it, you know, reading really uh, like she she was she wanted to believe that she still had three or quarter of a <laughs> gas. She ran it slam out. Uh, technician A says a faulty printed circuit board. Wait a minute, who got that? What'd you get on that number twenty one? That's both of them, isn't it? That's a C. Number twenty two. A technician A says a faulty printed circuit board can cause a fuel gauge to give inaccurate readings. Technician B says wrong or a wrong faulty wiring or component failure within a fuel gauge circuit can cause the fuel gauge to give an accurate reading. This is right about that. You just you, you guys just kind of sitting there, ain't you? What do you think about? It? Okay, let me let's break this down into two questions. Technician A says a faulty printed circuit board can cause the fuel gauge to give an accurate reading. Can it or can it not? What do you think, Worley? I always have to ask Worley because Worley's a thinker. What about you, Clark? What do you think? Printed circuits, what I was talking about a while ago. If it's carrying no signal to that gauge and it's burned in two or somebody's damaged it, then you're going to have an inoperative gauge, right? And if, it's, if the appropriate trail is messed up. So that one's right. Now let's look at technician B. This is like two questions in one, and most people hate that because they feel like they're doing extra work when they get a technician A and B question. Technician B says faulty wiring or component failure within a fuel gauge circuit can cause a fuel gauge to give inaccurate readings. What do you think? Do you think component failure, uh, failure could cause it to give inaccurate readings? Clark, I'm asking you. Yeah. You could, couldn't you? Okay, so, uh, all right, say it loud. We're going to hear you. Uh, can faulty wiring cause it? If I went out here on the Ranger and I cut the wire going from the fuel tank sending unit to the gauge, wouldn't we get a faulty reading? All right, use the pumpkin. Now, Shelby, I know you can answer these questions because you're really sharp, okay? All right, let's see. Technician A says that if the fuel gauge does not read empty when the tank is known to be empty, the cap on the fuel tank may not be tightened down securely. Is that true? Can you leave your gas cap loose and cause your fuel gauge not to read right? No, that's dumb. I mean, I don't think Technician B says if the fuel gauge does not read empty when the tank is known to be empty, a vacuum may have formed within the tank. That's not true either. No, it's, not a, it's not operating on vacuum. Oh, Jeremy Williams, stick out your tongue. Mm. All right. All right. Let me see here. Okay. We're coming close here. Technician A says if the brake warning light comes on when the ignition key is in the on position and the parking brake is released, the brake system may be leaking fluid. Adam, ask, find out if, what those guys out there are doing and ask them if they need something to work on. I mean, because they got worksheets. Okay. Right. The brake warning light comes on when the ignition key is in the on position and the park brake is released. The brake system may be leaking fluid. What do you think about that? Is that true or is that false? How many of you have ever seen the red brake light, red brake warning light come on when you didn't have the park brake applied? You ever seen that? What 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 did you find wrong with that one? It wasn't. Oh, the park brake wasn't all the way up. That's one thing that can cause that, and occasionally you may have to pull up onto your foot. Uh, but what else can make the red red brake light come on? Jeremy, what do you think? What else can make the red brake light come on besides the park brake? You guys are smarter than this. Low, low on fluid. If it's low on fluid, it'll come on. Yep. Or, or how about this? If you've got a situation where you're, you've got different pressure in the back and the front because you've got a leak in one part of the circuit, it's going to move that little thing off center in the proportioning valve. It's going to fire up at the brake light so you'll know there's a problem. You'll usually, in that case, feel something, you know, wrong with your pedal too. All right, let's see. Uh, let's see what technician B said. If the brake warning light fails to come on and the parking brake is applied, the ignition key is in the own position, the warning light bulb may be burned out. And yeah, I'd say that when you say that, both, would you say both those guys are right or is one of them wrong? Both those guys are right, aren't they? And finally, number twenty-five. Technician A says that if a slow-acting instrument voltage regulator causes rapid vibration in the needle gauge, the regulator should be adjusted. Well, you can't adjust those. Now, the voltage regulator like that one on the wall over there that you see on that blue board, well, those kind, that square voltage regulator right there, those kind can be adjusted, but that's actually for the charging system, not for the gauges. Uh, now, the other kind, the solid-state ones, you can't do any adjustment on that. Yeah. Um, 
All right. Did you? Uh, oh, you had. Did you have a uh, engine performance? I mean, an automatic transmission test. Yeah, like test six. I can't. I'll try to find it on the computer. Or Let me see what you got here. This one. This be for hand up. Oh, trans. All right. See if you can find it on that jump drive. I think that you're gonna that's six X. You'll see it. On there. Yeah, maybe like the, 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 back the work the seat. Like, I mean, the test laser here is on there, but the question is for handout, isn't it? Is that right? Hmm. We'll test that, and I mean, if it's not, I'll figure. I'll keep, yeah. fix you up with a handout. I'll hook you up, fat. All right. Okay. Technician A says if a slow acting engine, well, you can't adjust it. Technician B says uh, if all gauges fail to function, the individual gauge needle should be checked first. Twenty-five. That's actually D. Neither one of those guys are right. If you don't have any operational gauges at all, what are you going to do, guys? What's the first thing you're going to do? No operational gauges. What you going to do? Use your head, yeah. That's smart. Yeah. Check power by checking fuse and then, you know, ground. Like I say, you always check what's quick and easy. Uh, all right. Turn those in, and you guys are good to go.